Doing, doing well today. Uh, we have a we have a, a very special guest in our continuing lecture series. The guest today is Dr. Phil Smith. He has a PhD in philosophy, but he's the chair of George Fox University's religious studies. That's right, religious studies department. And it, it would not be an exaggeration to say that his talk today and his work in general is antithetical to what I want to do intellectually and where I want to move the society and the culture. <laughs> it's true. But, but that said, uh, I think that you need to hear the other side and you need to, to make an evaluation of these arguments and ideas yourself. And that's why he's been gracious enough to come in. I will say two, two more things. I said before that I respect people who are sincere in their beliefs, even if those beliefs do not accord with my own. And I gave the example before the scandal broke of Dinesh D'Souza. I do not think he's sincere. I, I do think that Phil is very sincere in, in what he believes. And I think that, that's important. That's always mattered to me. The second thing I want to say very quickly is, particularly for, for students who, who are not from this country, one of the things that I have always loved about this country is American exceptionalism. And, and in this particular task, even though Phil and I have radically different epistemological and metaphysical um, commitments or leanings or ways of viewing the world, I bear no ill will against him. In fact, I think he's a nice guy. I, 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 I bear no ill will against him. I, I don't think he bears ill will against me. <laughs> we'll see when we come to number two. Okay. Uh, but, but that's what we do in this country. We engage ideas in open forums, and we criticize ideas and not people. And so throughout the talk, be thinking of that. And the same break structure is going to occur, and we're going to have plenty of time for questions. Yeah, right? yeah, I'm going to try to do the whole thing in the first hour, and then we'll have a break, and then... Questions for the rest Perfect. of the second well, Warm PSU welcome. Thank you very much. Um, just a couple words about myself and then we'll plunge into this thing. Um, I did a degree at George Fox College. That was way back when in the 1970s. And then I went to a uh, Fuller Seminary, an international seminary. Boy, religious guy all the way through. Did my PhD at the University of Oregon in mostly ethical theory. My dissertation was in um, moral progress. Since then, I work mostly in ethical I issues, pacifism questions, um, but mostly virtue th questions. Uh, 2002, I put out a little book called The Virtue of Civility in the Practice of Politics, which is unfortunately out of print because people need to read it. I can name some people who should read it, but um, they haven't. Um, Mark McLeod Harrison, a, a friend of mine, and I jointly put out a little book in a, apologetics called Being at Home in the World, so you can get that. And I don't feel bad about advertising it since we've arranged that all the profits go to the undergraduate um, student philosophy club at George Fox. If you really want to make me rich, you need to go online and buy my novel, and uh, you can find out about that. And my newest novel I'm giving away for free on my blog, so if you like some science fiction uh, that has some theology in it, then we'll do that. So that's enough about me. Why faith is a virtue. Um, this is a book project that I've been working on in 2007, 2008. Um, got it done, submitted it to a bunch of publishers. They all rejected it. Um, by 2009, I was pretty happy that they had rejected it because I wasn't very happy with some of the moves that I made in the book. Um, and then, Given some reading that I've done recently and some thinking that I've been doing for the last three years, I've made some changes, I submitted it, and suddenly there's a publisher interested in it. Isn't that wonderful? One might say that it's even divinely inspired. Um, the point, or maybe the better lesson to learn from that is that uh, intellectual problems are not easy, and you might have to work on them for several years. And you can come back to a problem and keep working on it and make some success. And, don't get discouraged if you haven't figured it out in three months. Just a piece of practical advice. Okay, so why, is, why faith is a virtue? We have to start by talking about what a virtue is. Um, and this is not really that hard. Uh, there's a lot of literature on the, in virtue theory, um, and most of the uh, authors will agree on some main features. First of all, a virtue is something that's good. 
you can develop characteristics that are bad, and we'll call those vices, right? Um, and that is precisely the issue here between Peter and me, because he would like to say, I've heard him say in public, that faith is a vice. And I'm going to suggest that faith is a virtue. So the first thing about a virtue is that it's a good-making feature of a life. The second thing, and this um, depends on uh, Alistair McIntyre, and I think most people will agree with it, is that it's acquired. Since the ancients, there have been lists of virtues. And some of them, if you go back to Aristotle or uh, Homer, some of the things that were eretes in, in Greek, and excellence, would have been things like strength or beauty. Um, you're just naturally born with the virtue of beauty. Well, typically the virtue tradition has not gone that way. Instead, the virtue, a virtue is something that you acquire over time, or at least it's something you can aspire to acquire. Because if, if virtues are that way, then there are things that you can work on. You can get better at them, or worse, by inattention and laziness, right? Um, so thirdly, a virtue ought to be a trait. This is what we usually think about. Virtues are traits of a characteristic, they're characteristic of a person. That means that you don't have to act honestly in every single case to be honest. Um, but it's a tendency in your life. You can depend on these people more than others. Um, now, there has been some interesting research in recent years by some people called the Situationists, who are they're a bunch of psychologists. Um, so, you know, I have no respect for that. I'm married to a psychologist. It's an inside joke. Um, so, the Situationists say, look, um, all of this virtue theory talk by the philosophers is nonsense because um, it's really the situation that you put a person in that really determines whether or not he or she acts honestly. You, you give, and so their, their research goes something like this. They give uh, a self-evaluation to a bunch of people, and then they classify them as the honest and the dishonest according to their self-evaluations. Then they put them in test situations um, where they have a chance to be dishonest with nobody catching them. Very high rates of dishonesty, both groups. You put them in a situation where they're going to be caught, they're supervisor, There's, the police are there. Very low rates of dishonesty, both groups. And the situation is, they say, see, it's all about the situation that you're in, it's not about the actual tendency of the person. Therefore, there are no such things as virtues. I'm looking for your reactions. That's a terrible argument. It's a non sequitur. You should be saying, whoa! There, there will be questions later. Honesty was the only virtue. Well, they're, they're, they were trying to test for, for honesty. Well, we'll come back to that. I'm just going to point out that, uh, that that's a little test for you. The situationist argument is not persuasive at all, and we can come back to it later if you want to. See, I'm going to stick to the main line here and drop lots of these little presents that you can ask about later, because uh, we're going to have lots of time for that. So these are all basically agreed upon for features of uh, a virtue that the philosophers involved um, would not really hassle with very much. Now, there is something that there's a real dis difference among important philosophers on uh, the virtues. And this is a picture of Bob Adams, a very tiny picture. It's unfortunate. He's got his, little, his camera there, and he's going out to do some camera shooting or something. Um, uh, Adams is a very important uh, moral philosopher. He's been writing in uh, areas of philosophy of religion and moral philosophy for, I don't know, 40 years. Um, Finite and Infinite Goods is a really important book, and based on that, his A Theory of Virtue is a, an important book. Um, Adams defends the idea that virtues are intrinsically good. So I'll give you my example, not his. Well, his example is, imagine uh, a little old lady in her wheelchair. Uh, she is so, or maybe in her bed, she is so um, limited by her physical abilities that really, she can't do anything. She suffers a lot. But let's imagine that this little old lady who is suffering, this is going to be some of you. This is your future. And if you change it to a little old man, it's some of us. Me, right? Um, we are dependent creatures, and some of us are going to face old age, and it's not going to be very happy. Um, but she addresses, she deals with this situation with great patience with great courage, with self-control. Now, how does this, her patience, courage, and self-control show up in her behavior toward others? They don't. She's so helpless, she really can't do anything. 
Her virtues don't achieve anything in the world. Are they still valuable? Are they still good? Adam says, yes, they are. Vir virtues are intrinsically good. Even if they don't achieve, and even if they're not instrumentally useful. Now, I agree with uh, Adams, but I'm not using his intrinsic definition of uh, virtue in the, the book or in this argument. Instead, I'm going with Alistair McIntyre and After Virtue, um, very influential book. I mean, if there is a philosopher who has actually achieved fame, Alistair McIntyre is probably pretty one of the very few who might get there. After Virtue has been out for 32 years and it's been a very, very important book. Um, his definition of virtue in After Virtue is basically instrumental. A virtue is a virtue because it leads to something good, right? Now, and what are those good things? Uh, we'll come to that in a moment. I'm agreeing with Adams that virtues are intrinsically good, but the argument's going to depend on McIntyre, and the reason is just very practical ones. Um, virtually everybody who thinks that virtues are intrinsically good will also agree that they're instrumentally good. Those who think that they're instrumentally good may not agree that they're intrinsically good. So I'm going with the, you know, catching everybody and going with the instrumentally good definition of a virtue. So now this is reducing several chapters of uh, after virtue to three bullet points. So you know that this is unfair and you ought to read it for yourself. Um, <coughs> The first thing that uh, virtues do, says McIntyre, is that they tend to produce the internal goods of practices. Practices are social, socially embodied co cooperative activities that people are in Greek, uh, uh, participate in. Our lives are made up of lots of practices. Practices <coughs> like playing football or going to class or studying philosophy or playing in an orchestra or building buildings. All of these are socially embodied cooperative activities that have goods internal to them. And the only way to get those goods is to practice or to train yourself in the, the appropriate virtues for the different practices that people have. Um, mere skills, um, <clears throat> McIntyre says, throwing a football with skill is not a practice. You could do that all by yourself. But playing football is a practice because it depends on being socially interactive with other people. Now, be careful. Um, gardening, even if you do it alone, is a practice. Because when you garden, you participate according to the standards of excellence that other gardeners have established. I mean, you can't just go down the street throwing pebbles and saying, I'm a gardener, I'm a gardener, I'm a gardener. You have to conform to the standards of excellence of the practice, and that's a socially established uh, activity, right? So you can't just do anything you like and call it architecture. <laughs> you have to conform to what the architects do. Okay, so, and virtues are helpful in producing the internal goods and practices, he says. But in living good lives, we don't want to just, you know, there are, there are literally thousands, maybe more than that, of practices that you can choose to be part of your life. You can't do them all. That's one of the problems of the good life, is you can't do all the good things that are available to you. So you have to choose. Um, so virtues have a second use, that they train us, or they sustain us, in our search for the good life. Part of the good life is the search to understand what the good life is. It's not, the good life is not hit, handed down to you by some great person off of the mountaintop who says, this is the way to live. It's good. No, this is something that we search for together. We, we have to argue about it. Even the dis very extreme di divisions between Peter and me can be seen as an internal search together for the good life. And we need virtues in order to do this. One of the virtues Peter just pointed to, we have to be honest with each other. The search for what the good life is will be undermined if we're dishonest with each other. The third point that he says that um, virtues tend to sustain the traditions of practical reason. Um, Descartes kind of had this uh, idea that he could approach philosophical questions 
from square one, as if he was just all by himself, starting alone. Self-deception all the way down, isn't it? None of us do, do that. When Descartes was thinking, he was thinking in French. <laughs> Who made it up? He inherited it. It was a gift to him. Or maybe Latin. But Latin was certainly a gift to him because he had to go to school and people had to teach it, had to drive it into him. You think with the gifts given to you by prior generations, we all do, we ought to face up to it and we ought to be grateful for it. Ah, gratitude is one of the virtues, by the way. It helps us inhabit the traditions of intellectual inquiry that we're part of. So these are the, the notice that all of these definitions of virtue that McIntyre has are instrumental. Virtues are good because they tend to get us the results of these good things. All right? So that's what I'm going with uh, as a definition of, of a virtue. So here are some examples of McIntyrean virtues, and there are many, many others. <clears throat> Humility. Suppose, and this is an example from Iris Murdoch, suppose you want to learn Russian. Guess what? You have to submit to the way the Russians talk. You say you don't like those weird letters. Tough. You have to be humble enough to say, I'm learning Russian. I have to do it their way. Um, there is a certain amount of humility necessary in the beginning stages of all practices. And this is a big problem for one that most of you have left behind by a few years, but so you can remember this, the practice of learning to drive. Very important socially established practice, and the adults teach the kids, and the adults get frustrated about it because the kids want, they think they know how to drive as soon as they turn the car on. They don't have the humility that they need. Honesty, which I already mentioned, helps us to debate the goals and standards of our practices. Um, if a practice is going to endure over time, it has to change. So we have to have a debate within the, the tradition, within the practice, what does architecture mean today? It doesn't mean the same thing it meant 300 years ago. The skills, the kinds of things that we're going to do in architecture today are going to be different because we're having different problems. We have greater, bigger cities. How are we going to solve these architectural problems? In order to solve them, we have to have honest conversations with each other. So notice that courage is also going to be needed in any kind of a practice because you, at some point you have to challenge the way other people think about it. You have to challenge each other. So uh, humility and honesty and courage and obviously persistence. Many of you are very aware of persistence about this stage in the semester. Um, one thing that is absolutely necessary for success in this class is that you don't give up at the you know, Thanksgiving time or, or even <laughs> Halloween time. You've got to persist right through and keep reading. As I mentioned before, you could be working on a philosophical problem. I could be working on this, this particular book now for several years and felt very discouraged about it because I thought I made a mistake and I did make a mistake and now I solved the mistake. I'm moving ahead. Persistence is a good thing. And many others. Okay. We have a, a kind of an idea of what uh, virtue is. The big question here is what is faith? Uh, this is Ludwig Wittgenstein. Um, my uh, work study assistant said, I went on the web and I couldn't find any picture of Wittgenstein except ones that made him look like he was coming off drugs. <laughs> um, so you have access to the internet here. See if you, some of you can find better pictures of Wittgenstein. I don't know what the deal was. Um, maybe the problem was he was working on some of the basic philosophical problems of the 20th century and he was a genius. Um, you know, he was Wittgenstein. That's a lot like saying Gates, son of Gates. You know. Yeah. So this is Wittgenstein, son of Wittgenstein, the richest man in Austria. He gave it all away. Interesting character. Anyway, um, in the blue book he says, don't let a substantive, that is a word, make you assume that there is some reality co corresponding to it. Just because you have a word doesn't mean that there is a thing. We often confuse ourselves. We go around saying, what is time? Augustine said to himself, I know what time is until somebody asks me, and then I can't explain it. Um, the assumption there is that there is a single thing that corresponds to our word. And so Wittgenstein says, he's an analytic philosopher, and analytic philosophers often, typically, their first move is, our philosophical problems are caused by inattention to language, 
or as Wittgenstein himself said, language gone on holiday. We, call, we cause our problems because we aren't careful about our words. And so if we can be, uh, as G.E. Moore would have said, if I could just get clear about this. So analytic philosophers strive to be clear, and Wittgenstein says in his later uh, stages, the philosophical investigations, he says, the way to get to clarity, and I'm paraphrasing, the way to get to clarity is to not think, but look. Now, boy, that could be taken out of context. Obviously, he's a brilliant thinker. He obviously wants you to think. What he's saying, though, is in order to sort out the problems we have with language, look to see the way people actually use the words. And he gives the famous example, of those of you who've read the investigation, of games. Is there anything that holds all the games together? Think of the different games. There are running games. There are ball games. There are um, board games. There are solitaire games. There are games with scores. Do all games have winning and losing? No. Do all games have teams? No. What is the central feature that unites all games? And Wittgenstein says, there isn't one. Instead, there is, and he introduces the idea of family resemblances, that this game is like that game in this way, but it's different from that game, and that game is like that game, and that's so you'll have Imagine going into a great big English manor house, right? And you're walking down the hall, and they have all of the portraits of everybody who's owned the manor house over the last 50, not 50, 500 years. And you can go down the lines, oh, yeah, these are the Stuarts. And there's the Stuart nose, and there's the Stuart eyes, and there's the Stuart crummy beard. And, there's the, and you go down, but do you see anyone that's in all of the pictures? <laughs> no. Hopefully not. <laughs> so... Wittgenstein says there are family resemblances between these different words, but don't be taken in just because we have a concept or a word that we have a single thing that it names. I'm taking that advice seriously here. I want to apply Wittgenstein's advice to the idea of faith. How does this word actually work in our language? I think faith is used in different ways by different people. I'm going to run through eight different meanings of faith. Um, and these are by no means an exhaustive list. You can come up with other ones. What happens is if we have different meanings of faith, then if we aren't careful about what we are saying, we can talk past each other and disagree without good reason. Um, so I'm going to run through all eight of them kind of demonstrate the different, many different uses of faith, and it's number eight, of course, that I'm most interested in, because that's the one that I'm going to argue is a virtue. I might think some of the others are virtues, but I'm going to explicitly say that some of them are not virtues. Faith one. We owe this to Puttenhead Wilson. Faith is believing what you know ain't so. Of course, Puttenhead Wilson is a character made up by Mark Twain, who's also Sam Clemens. There he is in his later years. I hope I look that good when I get to be that old. Um, Puttenhead Wilson says, believing, a faith is believing what you know ain't so. Now why would Clemens, I mean obviously this was a joke, but Clemens is making fun of a certain kind of people. He's actually heard people who say things very similar to this, and he's not the only one. In Through the Looking Glass, we have this wonderful scene where Alice is having a conversation with the White Queen, and Alice says, you can't believe impossible things. And the White Queen says, well, I'm just going to try. Why, I used to work when I was your age. I worked on it for half an hour every day. In fact, I've believed six impossible things before breakfast. Lewis Carroll is obviously making fun of somebody, too. And I think that... Twain, Mark Twain and Lewis Carroll are making fun of pretty much the same idea. The idea that faith means believing things that you know are false. Faith means believing things that are logically impossible. Well, if that's what faith is, then it really is a vice. And I would be happy to be the first one to say it's a vice. It's important to say that uh, this is a use of faith. Apparently, and we're talking 19th century here, that both Twain and Carroll noticed in some people, and I suspect you can probably find people today who would use faith sort of this way. 
a second version of faith. This is the idea that faith means believing without doubts. Now here you'll find some religious people, and they actually have some uh, uh, texts who, that seemingly support this. In the famous scene where Jesus has been walking on the water, and he invites Peter to walk on the water, and Peter starts, and then he sinks. And Peter, Jesus catches him and saves him. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So people get the idea that doubt and faith are inversely proportional. One goes up, the other goes down, right? So the more faith you have, the less doubt you have. The more doubt you have, the less faith you have. Now, whether or not this is a good interpretation of the biblical story, it's the idea that people have. That faith... How are we doing? Oh, man, this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Got to go faster. Uh, there's apparent support in Scripture, then. Um, this can lead to an unwillingness to look at evidence. If you really think this way and you think that faith is a good thing, then you're not going to be ready to look at evidence. And in the extreme form, you'll say that there's no possible counter evidence to my belief. Now, I'm not sure, this is why the question mark here, um, I think this is the kind of faith that Peter Bogosian has noticed in some people. If he hasn't noticed it, I certainly have. Um, and when he notices it, he says it's a cognitive sickness. Because if you get to a point where no possible counter evidence can be there, that's a vice. That's not a virtue. Three. Some people think that faith is a special way of acquiring beliefs. Um, there's a famous debate between, uh, or series of uh, articles between uh, W.K. Clifford and William James about this, where William James apparently is arguing that there is a place for will, for desire, in choosing to believe. And to this day, you can find many people who will say, I choose to believe whatever it is that they're choosing to believe. Um, Simon Blackburn, you can see here, is a philosopher at Oxford, and this is the kind of belief, or kind of notion of faith that he is uh, ex uh, talking about in his book, um, Truth, A Guide. Um, and it's clear, he condemns it. I mean, this is the sort of faith that he is thinking about, and he's against it. Um, I think that it's more complicated than just being uh, uh, purely against it because um, it varies from uh, slight to extreme. So there might be variations in this kind of faith. Um, so, but the idea here is that faith is a special way of getting to know things. Now notice about two and three. People may share, may have faith two and faith three, they may think of faith both of those ways, or they may think of only one or the other. So they're, they're not coextensive. Faith four, faith is not a special way of acquiring beliefs, but it's what you do with the beliefs once you already got them. Now you can find this in Arthur Holmes and C.S. Lewis. Now obviously, now, Faith three was clearly a case of people with religious faith, and often faith four is people with religious faith, but notice the clear contradiction between them. So uh, it's, it's important to recognize that religious people don't all agree about what they mean about faith, and they ought to think about it more. Um, it's important, if faith is not a way of acquiring beliefs, but what you do with them, this points to a helpful medieval distinction between fiducia and fidus. Fidus is kind of what we might say the content of what you believe. Why fiducia is what you, um, how you believe in it, how you trust in it, what, how you react to what you believe. It's one of them. Christians believe that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That's fidus. You just believe that that's true. If you commit yourself to that, if you depend on it, if you trust in it, that's fiducia. So obviously what Lewis and Holmes are talking about is fiducia, not fidus. Fidus, Fide, you just get by ordinary means. Faith five. Thomas Aquinas and Alvin Plantea say that faith is a gift of God. Now here we really are dealing with religious faith. Later I'm not going to be talking about religious faith, uh, strictly speaking. Um, so faith is a gift of God for things that you need for salvation. Um, this gift might be built in, and it seems that both uh, Flanagan and Aquinas would think of it that way. It's kind of a natural thing 
that God gives you kind of built in. If, it doesn't, if things don't go wrong in life, you will just naturally develop to believe in God. We call it, uh, and in Latin you'd call it the sensus divinitatis. Um, you naturally are predisposed to believe that there's a, a thing here. It's kind of curved and ugly green. Um, because you can see it, right? Well, you are naturally disposed to believe in God um, in many situations in life, says Pliny. Now, Aquinas says that right reason can establish some things of the faith if people can think well. But for common people who can't learn Latin, I mean, for most people in Aquinas' day, you know, most people were illiterate and couldn't read. Um, I don't suppose that was redundant with me, other than I couldn't. Um, <laughs> God might just give them faith directly, but uh, some things can be figured out. Um, simple folk may have to believe by faith. Of course, there are some things that nobody can figure out, and we'll have to have faith for them anyway. Faith six. This is, depends on um, uh, Jay Wood, I think, made a very important point. It distinguishes between thin faith and thick faith. Thin faith is what he refers to as, uh, would describe as that trust, or again, we're back to the fiducia notion of faith, that trust that we all put in basic epistemic faculties. We all do it or else we can't do intellectual work at all. Um, while thick faith, he wants to reserve for religious faith or ideological faith like belief in capitalism or communism or something. Um, this is important because many people have observed that we all have thin faith. Um, Hume, points, Hume wants to be a strict empiricist, let's say. We're only going to know things that we know from experience. But then Hume does a little bit of analysis and he says, all of our experience depends on the prior knowledge of cause and effect. But we never observe cause and effect. So the fact that we can't observe cause and effect undermines all of our observations. Skepticism. Well, modern philosophers say, well, look, uh, there are some things that we'll call basic beliefs that you just, we all believe. We believe that our senses give us information about the world. We just trust them. And if you don't trust them, you can't do any intellectual work at all. We can give more examples, but we're going to move on. Now, it's important to say there's an important fallacy that religious people sometimes hammer Peter with, and so he will uh, appreciate at least this part of the lecture. <laughs> they say things like this. Look, we all have to have faith. Thin faith, in Jay Wood's term. Therefore, we might as well go all the way and have faith and believe in God. Thick faith, in Jay Wood's terms. That's fallacious. It's a bad argument. And we ought to quit doing it. Now, it's true that fiducia reveals that we are unaware of many of our fides type beliefs. We trust things. We don't actually make the fides explicit until we think about it. Right? Um, every one of you has the belief that there is no... How many of you see that crazy movie, uh, uh, Tremors? <laughs> tremors? Have you ever considered that there's a tremor monster right outside the door and is about to get you? You have the belief that they're not there. <laughs> Faith 7. Um, I've been very happily reading Esther Meek this year. Um, she has been reforming my epistemological positions on a lot of things because she's really introducing me to really take Michael Polanyi seriously. Um, faith, she says, is a part of, an indispensable part of, the normal act of knowing. Where we, re now, now we're going to use uh, Polanyi's term, we rely on the subsidiary knowledge so that we can focus on the thing that we want to learn. Polanyi's example is, think of the doctor. Now, of course, he's he, before MRIs. So this doctor has a probe. And he's trying to decide, is there a tumor there? It, the probe is inside the person. So he's holding the probe, and he's concentrating deep inside this person's body, and ah, no tumor. He's focusing out here. The subsidiary is 
the way the thing, it actually will be felt. It'll be felt in your hand. Not just anybody can pick up a probe and be able to do good medical work. It takes a lot of training. It takes a lot of practice so that you know, oh, that feels, that feels. You know what it feels like. We inhabit subsidiary knowledge so that we can focus on this thing out here that we're trying to learn, says Polanyi. And um, Mink points out that there's faith involved in both places. You're trusting the thing that you have learned, and you're trusting that there's something out there that you're going to discover. You all have been through this. At one point in time in your life, somebody put them some marks on a piece of paper, and they said, D, D. And you learned your letters, right? Or maybe you were watching Sesame Street. I don't know. Um, <laughs> And there was a time when you had to focus on the letters and your focal attention was on putting it together so you could say, sheep. But now that you're a good reader and you're reading, you're reading <coughs> Wittgenstein, um, you're working your tail off and you're not paying attention to the letters. <laughs> you're paying attention to this very difficult concept out here. You are inhabiting your, what was prior a focal part of your attention has now become such a part of you that you can focus on something out here. The key thing to point out here is that debates about faith will reveal our assumption about, uh, assumptions about epistemology in general. Okay, so there's a connection between epistemology and these different views of faith. Oh, finally, all of this is preliminary. Faith 8. I'm going to suggest that, uh, and obviously this is not the definition of faith, Right? We've run through a bunch of definitions of faith. This is a definition of faith. I think it covers some, you, actually many, I think, uses of faith. Faith is believing things that other people disbelieve and living in the light of those beliefs. These are things that are not known. Uh, there's a little bit here about Aquinas and Aquinas' interpretation of Hebrews 11.1. We're going to leave out the history part for a while. So, these are things that you do not, it doesn't count as faith if you know it, right? I know that the Giants won. Yeah, they Game did. won. <laughs> so that is not faith, right? So it's things that you believe that you don't know. Believing things that other people don't believe. Which people? Well, there's lots of things that I believe that other people don't believe, but they're dead. Or they live thousands of miles away from me. Or they, have, or they live in a different epistemic world than I do. I'm not very worried about those things. I'm worried about Peter. Because he lives in the same epistemic world as I do. He reads newspapers. He reads scientific reports. He's like me. He's epistemically close. He knows that modus ponens is a valid argument. Now, given my definition of faith that I'm working with, that faith is believing things that people who are epistemically close to you do not believe, we all have prima facie reasons for, for doubt. The mere fact that Peter exists and doesn't believe in God gives me reason, since he's epistemically close to me, to doubt believing in God. <clears throat> Therefore, faith typically, in the typical case, coexists with doubt. So obviously I'm against the idea back that we had back on what was it, faith too, that faith is opposed, you know, that they're inversely proportional. I think it's possible quite often to have faith that coexists with doubt. What do you think about capital punishment? You think it should be abolished? Yes. You gotta know that there are lots of really smart people who think that we need to have capital punishment. I better know this and I think it should be abolished. Their existence gives me prima facie reason to doubt my position. <clears throat> but remember, back up one. Faith is believing other things and living in the light of these things. So it's fidus and fiducia. If I just entertain the idea that um, uh, capital punishment should be abolished and I don't do anything about it, then to what degree, well, at least I said something about it in public. Maybe that's something. Um, my claim is that this definition catches much of the way we actually talk about faith. That it's believing in the presence of the doubt that is caused by the existence of people that we respect. I would like to want to use that word. The people that we respect don't agree with us. That gives us reason to doubt. Now I'm going to argue that that kind of belief, 
Believing in the presence of doubt and living it is a virtue. Here's the argument. Faith, eight, helps us achieve the internal goods of important practices such as science, scientific research, social reform, and parenting. Traits that help us to receive, achieve the internal goods of really important practices, and I don't think you can think of many practices that are more widespread and important than these three. All right? I picked out some good ones. Therefore, faith, eight, is a virtue. The rest of this book, this is where Karen grabbed me back in, Karen's my wife, uh, 2007, and said, look, you've got to have some examples. I mean real examples, long examples, chapter-length examples. So I did. Um, but we're going to, so this is one of the, some of the really fun part of the book, and we're going to cut it down to three minutes. This is Alfred Wegener. Anybody ever heard of him? Some do. Wonderful. Um, he had an astronomy degree. He worked in meteorology. That's what his job was. But he was famous for being a polar explorer. Uh, and he came up with a theory in geology. So yeah, he's an astronomer. He's trained in astronomy. He works in meteorology. He, he's famous for moving around the Arctic and tramping across Greenland. But he has a theory in geology. And the theory is continents move. He called it continental displacement. <clears throat> well, that's interesting. He published this theory, and the geologists uh, didn't like it. Most geologists of the day were what we could call fixists. The surf surface features of the Earth stay where they belong. So in the 1920s, um, but, but the, same, the thing is that this is one of the reasons they hated him so much is that he was famous, and so his book got published, and people read it, and then the organized geologists had to say, wait, so what is this non-geologist doing? He's, God, these are stupid ideas. So they had big international conferences in New York City with the express purpose of shouting down Wegener. Now the truth is, he made errors. Uh, Wegener kind of thought that the continents were kind of plowed through the underlying substrate. And he didn't know why or how. He didn't know how, why the continents moved. And he made errors. According to his calculations, Greenland should have circled the Earth seven times in the last 10 million years. But he kept on persisting. He published his book four times, every time collecting more evidence. And he didn't just collect geological evidence. He collected paleobotany. He was what we would call nowadays an interdisciplinary scholar. He said, look, there's lots of disciplines that bear on the question of whether the continents move. And so he's, what we ought to do is look at the evidence from all of the different subjects that, or the disciplines that matter. And then, 1930, doing his Greenland explorer thing, he dies. In the story. Oh, and then in the 1950s, just when all this continental displacement stuff is finally forgotten, <coughs> out, of, out of court, the U.S. Navy starts mapping the seafloor of the Atlantic Ocean, and tectonic, plate tectonics wins the day almost immediately. Wegener was right. Um, I wish I had time to tell you the story of Henrietta Leavitt, because 100 years ago she was, um, and nobody knows, does anybody know who Henrietta Leavitt is? <sighs> Wonderful, a few people. Um, 100 years ago she was making uh, a, Discovering stuff that actually let astronomy just change the world. A hundred years ago, we did not know there were other galaxies. We did not know how far away the stars were. I mean, most of the stars. And Levitt is the one that did the basic research. But um, she actually is a good illustration of Faith 7, not Faith 8. So we're going to skip it. Sorry. I love this woman. Sorry. William Wilberforce. Now we're moving away from science, we're moving to social and political reform. Um, William Wil Wilberforce uh, was a, a short guy with uh, a great speaking voice. And it's very important in the 1700s because there's no uh, way to you know, amplify your voices. And so inheriting tremendous wealth from his father, who was a uh, um, merchant, he runs for parliament and buys a lot of votes and gets elected um, in his 20s. I mean, 
barely older than you, and he's in Parliament. Um, he has a religious conversion and decides that uh, he's, he, he thinks, well, why go to Parliament again? But he has some friends who told him, you know, you really ought to be, stay there. You might do some good in Parliament. And so he takes on these two goals of the suppressing the slave trade and reforming manners. <laughs> he wanted people to be better. Um, now, you might think he's much of some kind of a moralistic do-gooder, and yeah, he was. He wanted, he thought, you know, all of this whole thing about having public executions where we hang people and people cheer and cheer for hours, that's actually not very good for public morals, and we have to stop it. Yeah, he's, he's putting his moral idea, he's a moralistic do-gooder. Uh, bear baiting, you know, where we have, for sport, we put a bear in a cage and we kill him in public? He thinks we ought to get rid of bear baiting. More importantly, uh, be before, besides reforming manners, um, he takes on the slave trade. Now, it's important to recognize that in the 1780s, 1790s, 1800s, because this goes on for 26 years, when he's campaigning against the slave trade, most of the economists and politicians of England say that you can't do that. Yeah, it might be bad to enslaved people. It might be bad for people, but we need it. Economically speaking, you will bankrupt Britain if we st stop this. We can't do it. He believed he could. He believed that they could do it. So it's clear that he believed something that other people didn't believe, just like Wegener believed something that the other scientists didn't believe, and he continued to believe it and persisted in believing it and committed his life to in making it happen even though he had prima facie reason to doubt it. He had faith. <clears throat> now, he was a Christian as well, but that's separate. His faith that I'm talking about here is his social faith, his belief that this could be done politically. We can win, and it can be done without bankrupting the country. <clears throat> the slave trade was outlawed in 1807. In the British Empire, slavery was finally made illegal the year that uh, Wilberforce died. I think it was 1834. Many of you are aware of this case because of the fam famous, uh, now we've moved on to parenting here, the famous book, uh, A Color of Water, written by this man, James McBride. He writes it to honor his mother, that woman right there, Ruth McBride, uh, Ruth McBride Jordan. Um, Ruth McBride Jordan um, was a little, Jewish girl from Virginia who had an uh, uh, abusive uh, father who ran away looking for love, and she found it with Dennis McBride, a black man in New York City, and they got married, and they had a lot of fun, and they started churning out children. Um, Andrew McBride, or James McBride, I should say, was number eight, uh, born, the, well, she was pregnant when his his father died. He was the last of the McBrides. Um, and so she Hunter married Hunter Jordan, another black man, and had four more kids. Twelve kids in the 1950s and 60s in the United States of America. Can you imagine in, in Harlem what might be some of the issues that she faces? Besides racism. <laughs> She's dirt poor. They are poor. She works in a bank where they have a free lunch counter, and she ha carries a very large purse. <laughs> so that when she comes home at midnight, the kids can have something to eat, right? Twelve children. The challenges, black power, street gangs, drugs, little white girl, little white woman with all these black kids, all these kids, and she's got the, the problem of bringing up their kids, but they don't know who they are. All my friends are black, and I got this white mom. What's going on here? So she's got to deal with all that, those kind of issues. And this is the 1960s, right? Tough stuff. Now, her explicit faith is Jesus is king. I mean, that's what she talks about, because she goes to church all the time, and she gets happy with all the other black women, except that she's not black. She, well, she was Jewish when she was a kid. She, when she married Dennis, she was converted. Uh, in, order to, in order to marry Dennis, she had, had to become a Christian. She was enthusiastic about it. Um, but her implicit faith, is the faith that I wanted to talk about, is her belief that her kids could make it. 
If it doesn't have something to do with school, and if it doesn't have something to do with church, I don't care about it. We don't want it. It's our family. You don't talk to other people. You talk to us. It's a very weird family she's got. Since she's going to work all the time, she sets up one of the older kids as the king or queen of the house. You've got to do what the king or the queen of the house says, or mommy will kick your butt when she gets home. Now there, how many, people, how many of you think that she's right? That you can raise 12 kids in this kind of a situation and succeed? How do you define success? Yeah. The success was that she was the 13th college graduate. After they had all finished college, most of them on to advanced degrees, she went to college. That was the 13th. It is 12.50. According to the rules of your class, we will take a 10-minute break. And then we will come back, and you can have, there has got to be at least four different questions. I think more like 40 questions that you're having. So, um, I'll take, take a break.